Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Donald Abrams. Thank you all for joining me again for our, the ongoing series of talks we're giving on professional development for adjusters. And we're going to talk today about what has to be either your most favorite or your least favorite topic as a workers' comp adjuster, and that's back injuries. Before we do, though, there's a couple of minor housekeeping things I wanted to share with you. This morning, I was talking with an oncology buddy of mine, and somehow the conversation as to the most frequent cancers came up. And the new literature out in the oncology world is that lung cancer is no longer going to be the most prevalent cancer in this country. Statistically, tobacco consumption is down to about 14% of the adult population. Unfortunately, here's the bad news. The most common cancer will, has become breast cancer. Clearly, 97% uh, of all breast cancers happen to women, and that's obviously the large part of our audience today. So I want to strongly encourage you to make sure you do your breast examinations, get your testing done, mammography. I know uh, uh, that it can be a tad uncomfortable, but the downside is so horrific, but breast cancer is really making a, a resurgence and uh, needs to be paid attention to. The other item is subsequent to our last talk a couple of weeks ago, got some ideas sent to me about what we could talk about otherwise. And I'm happy to say I'm putting together a talk on COVID. Uh, the good news with that one is that I'm not gonna be speaking. I've got two separate physician friends of mine who are uh, developed an expertise in the field and they're working with me in putting together several lectures that we're gonna produce uh, it, it again in this webinar series on COVID, how it applies to the workers' comp environment, what to expect and returning to work. But I just wanted to, to give you a heads up about those two things before we, we go on. So today we're gonna to talk about back injuries. We're gonna start with the uh, anatomy, the pathology, diagnosis and in the treatment. So you have a good sense of at each stage what you could, should be expecting from the clinical records what you should be expecting in terms of response to treatment and what is the best way to go forward. With anything, we need to understand the anatomy. And the anatomy of the lumbar spine, obviously it's the vertebral body, the bones of the spine. Between each bone is an intervertebral disc. You have to think of a disc as a shock absorber. It is designed to absorb all the weight of our chest and trunk and bounce back, if you will, just like a shock absorber on your car so that things go forward. I want to point out the ligamentous structures because the spine has to maintain a certain measure of instability. Just think about how fragile the spinal cord is or the nerve roots and what they do and what the body has evolved to, to protect itself. And, we need, and you need to have a good understanding of the ligamentous structures. And of course, we're going to talk about the spinal nerve roots, which is the path of everything that we deal with in terms of uh, the pathology, the pain, the treatment, the surgery, et cetera. So here we are, the key to it all, the lumbar disc and, and vertebral body. As you can see, this is a big chunk of bone. And it's a very thick chunk of bone, probably about an inch thick and can absorb a lot of weight. Uh, off the side here are the facet joints, where you can see down here where the cursor is, and the posterior, the spinous processes that stick out. This is a normal clinical situation, which you'd expect to see on any uh, imaging study of a healthy adult. Same thing, if, if you took and cut the body right across the old uh, magician trick, cutting the body in half and look down from top to bottom, here is that disc that my mouse is right here. And right in the middle, you can see this green area. This is the disc annulus. And in the center is what's called the nucleus propulsus. And when you talk about the herniated nucleus propulsus, it is this, this material, it's a very watery, but it's a gushy kind of material that, that doesn't always stay where it's supposed to stay. The analogy I like to use is a jelly donut. If you think as a doughy part of the jelly donut, this green part and the jelly itself, this part, this yellow part in the center, that's kind of the anatomy. And when you compromise that integrity of the jelly donut is when we get other issues. Additionally, back posterior are the spinal nerve roots right in the center of the spinal cord. The spinal cord ends at about L1, L2, some people a little higher, maybe a tad lower, but the nerve roots come off, go down the spinal canal and they exit at each level of the lumbar spine. Technically, the nerve roots end at from C1 
at every level down to S1. And those nerve roots go to different, innervate different areas of the body. So we need to know what is damaged so we understand what the symptomology should be and go from there. And then right here, you can see the epidural space. And back here is the bony structures. This little kind of looks like a sponge with all little holes in it, but that's how normal bones appear. So I wanted you to have a sense of the normal anatomy. So when we talk about the pathology, you get to know what we're going from. This slide is particularly important because this demonstrates all of the different ligaments. And a ligament is a tough, ropey structure that is really hard to pull apart that holds bones together. As you can see in the anterior longitudinal ligament, and back here is the posterior longitudinal ligament. And these ride on the anterior and posterior aspect of the vertebral body, preventing motion. Obviously, this is a very, the articulations here, the structure here is particularly complex. And when there's motion of these two vertebral bodies, such as this one here and up on above it, then obviously all the structures that live behind it can be compromised. Back here, you can see the ligamentum flavum. And the most common thing you'll see in the MRI report is ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, which means that this ligament has gotten bigger. And when it gets bigger, when it gets thickened, it compromises the space in front of it and behind the posterior longitudinal ligament where the spinal cord and nerve roots live. When they decrease in this space, then you'll get compromised to those nerve roots, which becomes problematic. Right here, I hope you can pick this up where the mouse cursor is, is the facet joint. And the facet joint is the only part in the entire spinal column where two vertebral bodies articulate. This is where they move. This is where the stability comes from. This is where the motion happens when you bend forward. This one will ride up a little bit on the, on the one just in front of it, and that's where it goes. Clearly, the lumbar spine doesn't bend forward at 90 degrees. What you get is a certain amount of motion at each level, and that total constitutes maybe an 80 degree lumbar flexion angle or a 20 degree extension angle, depending on which direction you're going. And you can see back here is, is the spinous processes. One of the things I'd like to point out with this particular side, with all these ligaments, transverse ligaments, posterior ligament of flavum, anterior posterior, all these ligaments, this is why you get a stable spine. What does not happen as often as our chiropractic friends like to tell us is that these ligaments don't tear, they don't become lax, and you don't get uh, the, the motion segment losses that all the chiropractors talk about, okay? So this is what it comes to when we get to that slide in a moment about lumbar sprains and strains. And I want you to remember this particular anatomy, the ligament is that anatomy when we talk about sprains and strains. In addition, we have a whole series of vertebral bodies. As you can see up here at the top or the cervical ones, they're only holding up the head. So they don't only have to hold up about 22 pounds, unless you're, you know, as my father would call me a fathead like me, they have to hold a little bit more. But as the body goes a little deeper, the bones have to hold up more weight. So we're at L4, L5 and the sacrum, this is holding up the most weight. Therefore there are the thicker bones and there you go for it. And the spine is supposed to be straight. And you, I'm sure you've heard in some cases, people's spines are not straight. If it, yeah, from the anterior posterior view of this, we're looking at, at the, on, a, on the left here, if it bends to the right, bends to the left, that's called a scoliosis. From a lateral perspective right here in the middle drawing, we see the normal lordotic curve in the thoracic spine. Again, curves hold up more weight than straight things as are, the Italians taught us, in, or I should say the Romans taught us in building bridges when you have arches hold more weight than a straight structure. If this angle, this little curvature increases from an anterior perspective, that's called kyphosis. And that can be a congenital variant or it be a function of an injury which has its own set of treatment parameters, which we'll talk about in a moment. Additionally, there's a separate lumbar lordosis. As you can tell back here, the backward curve, again, at this point, you're holding up the entirety of the chest, upper extremities, head, all that weight where most of the weight in, in humans is. So therefore, it, there's a lot of stressors here, a lot of compression, a lot of 
uh, uh, weight going through here uh, on the, and the physics of it. And this particular view is a posterior view of the spine. On the left, anterior. On the right, posterior. And you can kind of get a sense of all the spinous processes, the pedicles that shoot off to the sides, and the facet joints at each level. So again, having an understanding of what a normal spine looks like helps you understand the pathology. The second aspect we have to talk about are the nerve roots. We have the spinal cord, and as I mentioned a moment ago, the spinal cord ends at about T12, L1 in that region. It's not consistent with everybody. And at each level, a number of nerve roots shoot off and they innervate. That is, the nerves go to specific sections of the lower extremities or the uh, uh, abdomen, depending on the case. And you can get a sense of where the pathology is if these nerve roots are compromised. I want you to look at these little tiny little offshoots which go to the facet joints, which we'll look at in a moment. But again, if I have a specific disc lesion, say at L4-5 at this level right here, oh, I hit the wrong button, I apologize. Too quick, on oh, my fingers are too quick. If you have a disc lesion here, and you can see this little hole, the nerve root at this level is compromised, that I know there should be symptoms, motor loss, sensory loss in the lateral aspect of the lower leg because that's where the L4 nerve root innervates. Or if it's lower at the S1 level, that, that's motor function to the big toe. So if they have weakness to big toe function, I know it's probably an S1 lesion. And that's where the physical examination needs to correlate with the pathology noted and helps you come up with an appropriate treatment. Spine pathology can incorporate any number of findings. The spine is a particularly complex structure. And when you have that many complex structures, a lot of things can go wrong. It's kind of like when I was in the army and we were flying in helicopters and the running joke was, we're in a uh, machine that's holding itself off the ground with a million moving parts built by the lowest bidder. Yeah, that made you real excited. So when you have that many components, something can go wrong and you have to be able to sort out what exactly is going on so you can address the problem appropriately. It's a fact, most pathology in the lumbar spine is degenerative in nature. To be clear, when you have 35% of the population of this country being overweight, that puts a huge stressor on those bones as we showed you a few minutes ago, and the bones wear out. Therefore, it's degenerative. You can have significant pathology significant pain complaints. And it's not because you bent over to pick up your pen off the floor or you slipped a little bit and kind of twisted uh, and you grabbed yourself, it's degenerative pathology. And that's why it's crucial that you establish what the actual pathology is so that it can be appropriately assigned to whatever uh, payer is. Is it my injury? Yes. Okay, what is my injury? Or no, this is all degenerative pathology. And while he may require a surgery, it's not because of my injury. And we can establish with looking at the medical records and other factors, what is and what is not your pathology, which goes huge to cost containment strategies as we've talked about in the past. Acute pathology will stand out and direct us towards the structure compromised. And by that, I mean, if somebody's in a car wreck and they've got a complete translation of a fracture or the retrieval body, and this person can't walk, yeah, that's a significant injury, a significant pathology, and significant force. Bad things happen, they absolutely do, but they don't happen as often as low back injuries occur in the workers' compensation system. So when you've got somebody who talks about pain at every level of the spine, and when you look at this drawing, you see all the redness, which represents inflammation, while there are some providers who believe that you can inflame, injure, compromise every ligament, every muscle, every nerve root in the lumbar spine, it just doesn't happen. In medicine, we have a saying, common things happen commonly and rare things happen rarely. This won't happen. Can you get a, a disc lesion at one or two levels? Yes, you can. I had a good friend of mine who got out of the shower, bent over to dry his toes, and he blew out two discs in his back, dropped him like a sack of potatoes. He, 
he got to his phone, called me. I had to go pick him up off the bathroom floor to get him into his bed so we could get him cared for. That's how much he hurt. Okay. Those kind of things can happen. But lower lumbar injuries do not result in cervical spine injuries. Okay. That's simply why it's, it's imperative that you obtain a specific mechanism of injury. Additionally, I would encourage you to ask at every time you talk to that injured individual about the mechanism of injury to make sure it's consistent. I look at reports all the time and records all the time where the injury goes from I bent over to pick up a pen to me and a friend were picking up a 3,000 pound piece of equipment. Wait a minute, what's going on here? And we all seen stories where the mechanism of injury kind of gets worse as the case goes along that the injured individual is trying to justify why he's not getting better. But again, acute pathology will stand out. The diagnostic imaging studies will support that. Non-acute pathology is also easily identified. As we mentioned a little earlier, you see a diagnosis of sprain. And unfortunately, it has become all too commonplace to call it a sprain slash strain of the lumbar spine. I'm here to tell you, that's a garbage can diagnosis. That's the easy way out. That's a provider not doing his job. And he is doing a disservice to that injured individual and to the entire workers' compensation system. A sprain is an injury to the ligament. As we will see in a moment, and I just showed those ligaments in a few minutes ago, they're tough structures. They can withstand a lot of force. I'm not saying they can't be sprained. I'm not saying they can't be injured, but it just does not occur as often as we see it. As you can look in this drawing, kind of blown up here, here is the facet ligament. And you can see this little black line, this rent here, it's torn. It could absolutely happen. However, one level, okay? This is a sprain. The good news is if this sprain does happen, then the body will try to heal itself. What does that mean? It means that on MRI, we will see a T2 or STIR image that lights up white. Yay. Because then I've got objectification that there's pathology. Contrary to that is that if it doesn't light up or there's no evidence of any markers of acute injury, you can say that this is there is no sprain. And it, the difference is how you treat these, okay? A sprain will take very specific treatment and it'll take a lot longer than a strain. But we need to know exactly what you're dealing with. What you'll see commonly uh, from the docs who work with me is we will isolate the pathology noted, a soft tissue myofascial strain of the paravertebral musculature of the lumbar region of the spine or some language to that effect. And we're telling you, treat the strain, don't treat a sprain. There are two different ways to go, go for it. A sprain is much different than a strain. A strain involves a muscle and a tendon. A sprain involves a ligament. And the approach to the treatment is markedly different between the two. A strain is an injury to a muscle or a tendon. As you can see back here, this is the anterior aspect of the shoulder, excuse me, <coughs> the anterior aspect and the nice muscle. These little fibers, I'm not sure if you can pick up on, the, on this uh, slide or not, but they're little fibers. And one or two fibers, they can pop. Okay, just like a rope will pop or whatever. But there's other fibers to compensate for that, and you have that. Similarly, the fibers within the tendon and surrounding the muscle is a fascial sheath fascia, and that comes becomes a tendon and attaches this muscle to a bone. So where you have the biceps tendon in the upper extremity, which is right through here, this muscle, the, the fascial sheath comes together. I don't know if you pick it up right here or not. Right here becomes the proximal biceps tendon and attaches to the acromion, and that's where you get a, a biceps tendon injury. So dealing with a strain is different than dealing with a sprain, and you need to know what you're dealing with so you can do the most appropriate treatment. This becomes another reason why you need to obtain the specific mechanism of injury. It's crucial to establish if this is a soft tissue myofascial strain, which will get better on its own in a couple of days, or a tear slash sprain. 
I don't know if you ever had a sprained ankle, but in the grade of first degree, second degree, third degree. And sometimes a third degree ankle sprain requires surgical intervention. It's that severe, okay? But the reality is you have to add, define what it is so that you can come up with the most appropriate treatment plan. A dislocation can occur. A dislocation is defined as an alteration to the normal integrity of the spinal column. If you've got a dislocation, like some of our uh, non-physician providers uh, talk about, that's a bad news injury, bad news situation. Is it really there? This can be acute, but more often than not, it's degenerative, such as a spondylolisthesis, which means the vertebral body has slid forward, or a retrolisthesis, which means the vertebral body has slipped rearward or a retro behind the one below it. Again, this is a problematic situation. If it's an unstable spine, requires a fusion surgery. But is the instability a function of your injury or is this a long-term degenerative process is a question that has to be resolved to an evidence-based medicine reporting standard. An acute instability occurs after a major trauma. There's no two ways about it. Uh, you've heard of people in uh, diving board accidents and they break their neck more often than that. They, the, the two vertebral bodies neck are off in different directions and you compromise the spinal cord and all that complication. It can happen in the thoracic spine, most often in car accidents and in the lumbar spine, secondary to falls or something like that. But if we go back to the slide I showed you a few minutes ago about the ligamentous structures, you'll see that there's a lot of them there that the force necessary to overcome that integrity has to be severe, significant, and enough to tear all those ligaments. If that occurred, it's a bad news situation. We've all been there. We've all seen either, uh, had cases where a car accident or a major fall where bad things have happened. They're catastrophic cases and they have all kinds of complications. But it's an acute instability happens after a major trauma. That becomes the issue. So if what is going on here, guys? So basically, we have, if you look at these two vertebral bodies, you can see the posterior longitudinal ligament right here. Here's the anterior longitudinal ligament. They're intact, they're straight. At this level, everything's happy. You go one level below, oh, wait a minute, here's the injury. It was probably an, an anterior to posterior trauma going from the, on this slide left to right. And you can see where the ligament here is torn. But look at this even bigger ligament back here. This is really torn. This is a very unhappy spine. This is a serious problem. The spinal cord is going through here and all of a sudden it's gonna make a huge left turn slash right turn because it's, the rest of it's down here. Obviously these nerve roots are compromised. The spinal cord itself is probably not compromised but all the nerve roots that go through this area are causing significant problems. But if you've got this level of injury, this level of dislocation, then you know you've got a huge problem on your hands and you and you approach it as such, that this is an appropriate problem doing all the things necessary from uh, trauma surgery to case management and be ready for a lot. This is gonna be a huge, huge clinical situation. More commonly, we get what's called a disc herniation. Now, the downside to this is different radiologists have different definition for what constitutes a disc herniation. We know them as disc bulges, or a disc protrusion, or a disc herniation. I'm going to go back to my jelly donut analogy again. If you have a jelly donut in your hand and you squeeze on it, and you see a little bit of that jelly coming out, that's a disc bulge. It really hasn't compromised anything. It's not exactly where it needs to be, but the structures outside that jelly donut are not compromised or, or injured. So you really, no harm, no foul. If you squeeze a little harder on that jelly donut, then the jelly will protrude through the doughy part and stick out. Now, because we got the space in there, then it begins to compromise either the, the capsule or the nerve root or some other structure, and it becomes much more symptomatic and requires a different set of treatment. The last stage is known as a disc herniation. And that's when it's really through, and we'll see in a moment, 
compromises the nerve root. So if you keep that mentality in mind of how severe the, the nucleus propulsus is, how it's protruded through the annulus, then you get a sense of how severe the injury was. Furthermore, you can see that a little bit of a bulge is probably an ordinary disease of life, particularly when you look at the body habitus of somebody. If you've got an injured employee who's four feet, six inches tall and weighs about 900 pounds, clearly that weight is gonna compromise all those discs. And you're gonna get a disc bulge or disc protrusion secondary to an ordinary disease of life and it's not a function of the reported mechanism of injury. And there's another little bond mod for you. If you look at the MRI report and you see a disc bulge of three millimeters at multiple levels, L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5, and they're all about the same, that's a bell ringer for you. That is an ordinary disease of life degenerative process and there's no acute pathology. You do not get an acute injury that manifests itself with the same level of disc bulging at each level. The literature doesn't support that. The anatomy doesn't support that. So if you see that on MRI, that should be a real indicator to you like, wait a minute, I am not going to accept multiple level of disc bulges because that's not my injury. And we have stages of herniation. And again, I put, I put this slide up mostly to confuse you, but to show you that different people call them different things. We talked about a disc bulge, also noted as disc degeneration. We're going back here on the right and we see this circular jelly donut. The jelly is kind of creeped out a little bit. Maybe there's a little bit of a, a hole in the dome, but it, the integrity of the doughy part is intact. So disc degeneration, AKA disc bulge. Also known as a disc prolapse or a bulging disc. I'm sorry, a disc herniation. I'm sorry, I misspoke. See how, this is how easily it is to get confused with all these different things. But here's a situation where the nuclear material has clearly left where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be nice and comfortable in the center. It hasn't. It's pushing out. The annulus is pushing out against. It's changed its shape, its configuration. And this is compromising the nerve root that's running next to it. So this is a disc prolapse or a disc herniation. And then the last one is a disc extrusion. Okay. Extrusion means the annulus, the doughy part of the donut or the uh, the tough fibrous portion of the disc, the annulus, has ruptured. As you can see here, it's torn and the nuclear material is sticking out. This is a disc extrusion or a disc herniation. That's what they mean by this. In a more severe situation, you'll get what's called se sequestration. Easy for me to say. Sequestration, meaning that here's the nuclear material, but chunks of it have dropped out and they're in the spinal canal. And they can irritate the nerve root causing radiculitis or other problems. This can or cannot be a surgical lesion depending on the level and the symptomology, but this is the, the most severe aspect of blowing up the disc. And as you can imagine, these are all a function of pressure in an axial top to bottom scenario that pushes these jelly donuts, if you will, out and, and you lose the space of the jelly donut. Here is a real good example of a disc extrusion. Look at this disc material. Here it is at the rent in the annual material. Normally it's circular, it's a nice shock absorber, but because of the forces, this material has gone out and see right here, the nerve root is compromised. This big water itself is pushing against that nerve root. And what's happening is that the nerve root distally cannot function. The impulses, the sensory, the motor can't get through, can't get to the spinal column, get to the brain, the brain tells you what to do. It is compromised. So in this particular situation, I would bid cash money that the epidural steroid is not gonna work and this guy's going to surgery in this particular situation. But I need for you to know, let's go down one level and you can see where there's no disc lesion just below it. Look at this big hole right here where the nerve root gets to play. That's what nerve roots want. They want an area to play. And it's, we're, we're not talking a lot. We're talking a couple of three millimeters if you give that nerve root that two or three millimeters so they can kind of stretch out, do their thing, they're loving it. They're real happy campers. No symptomology associated with this one. This one, however, real symptomology. Notice that one makes a little bit of a right turn and a left turn to get around this. So that becomes real problematic. And that's what we're talking about with a disc herniation. And again, because I want to gild the lily, normal disc here, here is a bulging disc, but off to the right. Can you see here? So we're looking down the spinal column. 
again, it's what we call a cut on CT scan or MRI, but you can see where the nuclear material has kind of drifted off to the right. And on this bottom side, it's herniated through. If you look here and here, you can see the nuclear material has pushed up. I put this particular slide in to let you know that if there is MRI findings of a disc herniation telling you that there is a right nerve root herniation compromising the right L4 nerve root, then if you have symptoms on the left, it makes no clinical sense. So this is where you have to correlate the findings on MRI and the findings on physical examination, because on this particular situation, here's the nerve root, the left nerve root, not compromised. So if I've got, oh, my whole left leg is dumb, but the MRI says eh, he's got a four or five disc at, on the right, then it's like you know, true, true and unrelated. And by unrelated, I mean it's not your pathology. We all know a lot of people have degenerative changes. They all have back pain. Everybody and their brother wants it to be a compensable event for a lot of financial reasons. But it, the truth is, if you look at the clinical data, all the clinical data, and you have a detailed, appropriate physical examination, which doesn't match up with the lumbar spine studies, that's an issue that has to be resolved. And unfortunately, you'll see some surgeons who will say, oh yeah, it's all related because they want to do the surgery. Yeah, that's a different discussion, but here's what we're talking about. When we're looking at the findings on MRI, the findings on physical examination, the mechanism of injury, and all the other additional comorbidities that go into the overall calculus. Facet joints, as I mentioned earlier, facet joints is where the articulation and the spinal column occurs. It's two little rounded areas that kind of hold up so that the spine doesn't go forward, but that's where the motion actually happens. Remember, we looked at those, the vertebral bodies, they sit on top of each other, but as the elements that shoot off to the side, that's where the articulation is. <coughs> Facet joints are, they wear out, it's simple as that. When you rotate, when you bend forward, bend back, all the motion occurs at the facet joints. Think about the number of times your back moved in the last hour alone. You're not comfortable in your chair, you shift around, you move your back, you try to find that one comfortable position. Those are the facet joints moving. Multiply that by the number of years you've been on the planet and you can see that those joints are really gonna lose some of their integrity. This is a very common pain generator. However, it is not very common as a sequelae of the compensable event. If you look at the MRI report and it documents sclerosis, arthritis, or some other chronic degenerative process, clearly that pathology is the pain generator. And it's also as equally clear as that pathology is not a function of the mechanism of injury of bending over to pick this up or whatever the case may be. So if you've got people who wanna treat facet joint disease, I would strongly encourage you to say no, that's not my pathology. Remember, the statute requires that you only treat the sequelae of the compensable event. If I'm treating facet joint disease, you're treating ordinary disease of life processes. Now, having said all that, I know you may not prevail at hearing or the adjudication process, but I believe you gotta take your shot and try and keep it minimi and minimize what you're paying for. So again, just some drawings of the degenerative changes. Remember, here are the vertebral bodies you can see all stacked up on one another. Nice, good line right through here. The ligaments, you can get, you get a sense posterior, they're all lined up. But here in these little circles is where the motion occurs. And when the motion occurs, they can get irritated and irritation is reflected as it being in red, okay? This is degenerative facet joint disease. I would bet that if I put all of us in an MRI scanner right now, more than half of us would show up as having problems at that level. But that doesn't mean it's your pathology. Again, here's a better indication. Here's the facet joint in this little blue box. And you can see there's a vertebral body back over here, one in front of it. Here's the uh, spinous processes, the transverse, part, all the parts of the bone, a ligament. But look at through here, how this is roughened up, how it's irregularly surfaced and it's, the, the artist here drew in a little white area, which means bony sclerosis. And bony sclerosis is a long-term degenerative process that is not your injury. I'm not saying this person does not have significant pain
pain generators from the facet joints. I'm saying this did not occur because you slipped and fell two weeks ago. Therefore, again, when the verge facet joint comes up or medial branch blocks or facet joint injections come up, you are not treating the sequelae of the compensable event. You're treating age-related, ordinary disease of life, degenerative changes, which is not your responsibility. Treating the facet joints is clinically indicated, which brings me to the whole pre-authorization process where yes, if it's clinically indicated, the pre-authorization provider has to say yes. We cannot use compensability as a reason to say no. In this particular drawing, let's look at the facet joint. It's white, it's rough. I hope you can appreciate that on your screens. A little redness there indicating it's all irritated. Remember earlier when we talked about the nerve root, okay? The nerve root comes off of each level and there's an afferent nerve root off of that that innervates that facet joint. Well, we can't go in there and, and surgerize that. That's not rational. So what people do is they inject the facet joint or they do a facet rhizotomy. Basically, they sever the nerve root. So the nerve root is severed. You don't feel pain. Yay. That's the good news. The bad news is these nerve roots will grow back. I can tell you from personal experience, we did a surgery on a woman who was a paraplegic at T6. And we did a lumbar fusion surgery on this lady without anesthesia because there was no need to. She did, had no pain sensation above the level of, uh, below the level of her, of her transection. And we could do that surgery without any anesthesia, which is safer for her. Um, being in a wheelchair with a uh, paraplegic, spine collapses, all kinds of issues occur. Um, that's why we're doing the surgery. But I'm here to tell you, it was pretty odd doing that level of surgery on somebody who was awake and talking to you. Again, uh, facet injections are known to occur. If you look here at the facet joints, remember, here's the vertebral bodies, posterior, here's the articulation between the two different vertebral bodies and these two areas wear out. And when they wear out, it's kind of like rubbing sandpaper on sandpaper, which causes pain. So what do we do? One of the treatments is to inject a steroid and a xylocaine preparation into this joint space and numb it. We've all been to the dentist. He stabbed us in our jaw with a bivificate or some other anesthetic device so he could drill on our teeth. Yay, not my favorite, but better than the alternative. Same drill here. We're putting medication into this joint and we're taking away the pain receptors so you don't have back pain. Facet injections are self-limiting. They are never going to correct the problem. Some people may go two, three, four, six months without pain, but I'm here to tell you it's going to come back at some point. Some people get maybe two hours of relief, and that's that simply demonstrates that the xylocaine or whatever uh, anesthetic they put in there has worked. That wears off in a couple, three hours. So that facet injection really wasn't very successful, uh, other than to put the xylocaine and give that person a couple hours of relief. But this is what we're talking about when we're doing facet injections or facet rhizotomies. Obviously, do the facet injection first to make sure that's the pathology. And if the facet injection works, then we do the rhizotomy to cut that nerve root and take away the pain impulses and hopefully give that person a better quality of life. Fractures, fractures are known to occur. By definition, fractures are acute and it's a traumatic event in most cases. The key is the mechanism of injury. What happened to cause this fracture? I was uh, driving my van for the company and we're in a, in a 16 car pileup. And yeah, if we got an acute fracture, it's probably related to that huge trauma. Remember, these bones in the vertebral bodies of the lumbar spine are thick, heavy, very durable. They're not indestructible. Therefore, with the right amount of force, you know, if I took a sledgehammer to your back, chances are I'm gonna break a bone in your back. Major force hits the back, it can only withstand so much, there you go. However, fractures do require radiographic objectification because there are, as we're gonna show you in a minute, different kinds of fractures and the type of fracture gets treated differently. And it can be, one can be established as being your pathology or not your pathology. The types of fractures where they're called burst fractures, 
Also, there are a second type of fracture called compression fractures. We'll talk about those in a second. A pedicle fracture and a pathologic fracture. The burst fracture. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we see, here's the T11 vertebral body. And there was an, what we call an axial compression going from top to bottom. T11 got driven down into L1. And if you can see off to the left here, a chunk of bone has been crunched off. A hit B and boom, there it went. This is a burst fracture. And you can see right here, this gray line, this blocking line, that's where there should be bone and there is none because it's living over here somewhere. This is a burst fracture. They do reasonably well with limited treatment, most often just immobilization for three to six weeks. The next one is called a compression fracture. And basically the integrity of the vertebral body itself has been lost. I know a number of the attendees here are, are women who have issues with osteoporosis, osteopenia, particularly if you're postmenopausal. I would strongly suggest that if your doctor says, go get the DEXA scan to see if you are osteoporotic or osteopenia, get it done. I am a huge believer in doing those kind of pain in the took us kind of testing things just to make sure I don't have something because it's from a clinical perspective, it's so much easier to treat an injury or a problem early on in this stage than later on in the stage. If you have somebody who rolls into your clinic and they're a stage four breast cancer, not a whole lot you can offer that individual. You'll try and statistically one or 2% may survive, but do you want 101 odds? I mean, I don't think the answer to that is yes. So ladies, please, if the doctor says go get a DEXA scan or take a supplement, please do because what happens most commonly here is what's called a compression fracture. So the integrity of the vertebral body is can't withstand the, the forces, the weight to come right down again in an axial load. And what happens is you'll get a deformity. In, in this case, it's like a 15, 20% uh, percent compression fracture. It's what we call a pie-shaped deformity. But you can see the, the uh, structure here is compromised and that compresses on itself, causing that type of fracture. Here's another example of a compression fracture. And again, look at this, the top part of the, of the vertebral body and the bottom part, and you get a sense of how it's a wedge shape. And you'll see that on x-ray, wedge-shaped deformity, pie-shaped deformity, but that means a compression fracture. And what happens then is, instead of being nice and straight, you, the angle changes. And depending on the severity of this fracture, this becomes a more increased angle and you can get a kyphotic deformity. If you get a kyphotic deformity, that's surgery. Now, you don't use the surgery to treat the compression fracture, you're treating the deformity because if it gets past a certain level, like 30 or 40%, it will get worse. And when it gets worse, you can see how it changes the anatomy posteriorly back here. Look at this foramen right here and look at this foramen. Okay, this is compromising and all of a sudden the nerve roots get stretched out and you get all kinds of problems. So if there is a easy compression fracture, get them treated. If it's a more severe compression fracture, that treatment may require surgical intervention. Now I will tell you there is a procedure uh, where they'll put methyl methacrylate into these fractures. The ODG supports is only on very limited situations. It was about eight, 10 years ago, a lot more guys try to do that and we found it just didn't work. Again, everybody wants to treat these things and there's no real good solution depending on the severity because if this got much worse, then we're doing a fusion and we're doing steel plates and then change the anatomy and it becomes really problematic. On this last slide, here's an actual x-ray of a compression fracture. And as you can see here, it's in a pie shape. This is a huge compression fracture. This is probably 60%, <coughs> excuse me, 60%. And this obviously very problematic, very different. And I can tell you from personal experience, very difficult to treat. I try, we tried surgeries, I've been in a number of cases and they just really don't do well. Another part of the bone, remember the vertebral body is one bone. And here's the big thick part that we did, the weight bearing surface. Here are the facet joints. And here's the foramen here. This is where the spinal cord of the nerve roots live. They all go right down the back here. 
but there's a little frack, the bone here because between the, um, the vertebral body itself and the lateral process, and that's called the pedicle. And you can get pedicle fractures. These are oftentimes acute, um, but they can be a challenge to treat sometimes. So if you see the word pedicle fracture, make sure you got a good surgical consult to, make, to let you know what the most appropriate treatment plan is. But I just, you're gonna see this on occasion. I wanted you to understand what a pedicle fracture represents. Here, again, this is the pedicle right through here, the neck. If you can imagine this on x-ray, you see the, this portion here and then the snout here, the little ears up here. We call this a Scotty dog sign on x-ray. If the neck of the Scotty dog is broken, as you can see right through here, that's a problem. There is a ligament there still holding it together, fibrous tissue, but it's clearly not as stable as bone on bone, uh, uh, solid bone. Additionally, let's take a peek down here. Here's the front portion of this vertebral body. Obviously this is L5, here's the sacrum. See how it slid forward? <clears throat> because right through here, the pedicle is compromised, the vertebral body has slid forward. That's what we call spondylolisthesis. Now, if it's stable, it's, it's tolerable. If it's not stable, then that's a lumbar fusion waiting to happen, okay? But here it is, the integrity of the, of the, frag, of the pedicle is compromised here, causing instability here and it compromises the nerve roots posteriorly. As you can see, it gets more complicated and more things can happen and it's, it's hard to put it all together. And here's an X-ray. Again, here's the neck, here's the head and there's the pedicle fracture right through here. Now this one's been around for a while because it's kind of rounded and you can see some sclerotic margin, but this is a clearly significant pedicle fracture. <laughs> The last type of fractures are called pathologic fractures. And you can get bony tumors in the vertebral bodies. So you got normal bone here, normal bone there, and the tumor has eaten away at the integrity of the bone and they collapse. So it is a compression fracture, but secondary to the tumor and not secondary to a traumatic event. As you can see, I hit the wrong button again, I apologize. Oh, wait. I'm sorry, I apologize. <clears throat> My fingers don't wanna work with me today. As you can see here, look at this. this the, here's a, a normal bone, normal bone, but this one is just eaten away. Look at this surface on here, this big white dark spot here, that's cancer. That is a bad news situation this vertebral body is gonna go south. Now, this person could be asymptomatic and then do something uh, to cause this to fracture. Uh, that's, that's a difficult situation or it gets, just happens on its own. They wake up, they've got back pain, they go to the emergency room, they're told they've got a bone cancer and they've got uh, pathologic fractures. So it can be a challenge. I wanna talk about myelopathy a little bit. You'll see that uh, at this herniation with no evidence of myelopathy. And a myelopathy involves the spinal cord. As I mentioned earlier, the spinal cord tends to end at L1, T12 area, and we have uh, the nerve roots going distally in the lumbar spine. And this affects the upper motor neurons. Much more difficult to treat and much more problematic to treat. There will be a different set of physical examination findings so again, speaking to the need of a very detailed physical examination. Again, this is the lower lumbar spine, but as you see up here at L1, here's a disc herniation, and this is compromising the spinal cord. I know it's kind of tough for you guys to see, but there's a little area right there that compromises the upper motor neurons, and you get all kinds of issues relative to the lower extremity, and the approach is real different. As opposed to radiculopathy, a phrase you hear all too often and all, unfortunately, all too incorrect. Radiculopathy involves the nerve roots and not the spinal cord. It involves the lower motor neurons, the lower motor neurons. Be clear about that. So I'll get a motor function loss, as we mentioned earlier, the S1 nerve root. 
I can't dorsiflex my big toe. That's an indication of a radiculopathy involving the S1 nerve root. And this involves the more peripheral findings in the extremities, the lower the nerve roots, the lower the leg innervates. So here we have at L4 slash L5, a significant disc herniation. You can see some of the disc nuclear material back here. And look, this is completely uh, wiped out. Push that aside. That's a huge problem. <clears throat> That's a surgical lesion right there. I'm not a big fan of surgery, but at times it is required. <coughs> Treatment, again, as noted in the official disability guidelines, and to be clear, there are treatment parameters noted in the MD guidelines, which are very similar. They all read the same textbooks, but here in Texas, we have to play under the ODG rules and literature searches. Everybody is trying to find the best possible way to treat low back pain. A number of years ago, there's a couple of guys out in San Francisco who came up with intradermal electrotherapy, IDET, and it was the rage and everybody and their brother was doing it. And it cost $8,000. And within a year, we realized it didn't work. But a lot of people had that surgery at $8,000 a pop. So what do you do? The first visit, you want to identify if there are radicular signs. Do they have numbness in a particular area? Is there a sensory loss? Is there a motor function loss? Are there radicular signs? This is up to the evaluator, the doctor, the physician assistant, the nurse practitioner, who's ever evaluating the situation to get a thorough history. You want to rule out any red flags. Those red flags are saying, yeah, my leg's been numb for three months. Well, if your leg's been numb for three months and you got an injury two days ago, guess what? That pathology probably happened three months ago. Or they'll ask questions like bowel or bladder function. S1 nerve root innervates bowel and bladder function. So if you've got somebody who says, doc, I hurt my back and I can't control my water, that's a surgical emergency. That needs to go addressed really right away. Assuming there's pathology noted on MRI. So you wanna find out where are the complaints? Do the complaints make clinical sense? You're not gonna have a low back injury and your entire lower extremity will be numb. It doesn't happen. You may blow out one or two nerve roots, you're not gonna blow out all five nerve roots. And most often that lateralizes either to the right or to the left. So when they say, oh, I hurt my back, my entire right leg, my entire left leg, and my left ear are numb. Yeah, that doesn't make any clinical sense. And does it correlate with the reported mechanism of injury? You know, the guy who says he was picking up a 3,000 pound piece of equipment with a friend of his, and his friend dropped his end, therefore I hurt my back, makes no clinical sense. Go to Costco and try and pick up two cases of canned peaches and realize how heavy that is. <clears throat> and then multiply that by how many thousand times they get 3,000 pounds. Remember, a careful history, the patient will tell you the diagnosis. But all too often, we don't get the evaluations that we look at don't demonstrate a clear, careful history. The physical examination, this is, a hard, this is hard for people to do. Do it in three positions, laying, sitting, and standing. If there are neurologic findings, they'll be consistent in all three positions. So when you see somebody says, I got a straight leg raise that was positive at 20 degrees, which means there's no radicular injury because that's this muscle tightness at 20 degrees because the nerve root isn't stretched at that time. But their seated straight leg raising is, is negative at 90 degrees. That clearly tells you this is not a radiculopathy situation. This is somebody who knows that, oh, he picks up my leg, I'm supposed to say yes, irrespective of the actual clinical findings. So you wanna make sure that the physical examination is thorough. They do laying, sitting and standing particularly when they're finding positive neurologic functional losses. Palpation, again, we have to touch people. We have to palpate the musculature in the lumbar spine. Where is your muscle spasm? And we get, there's some providers in some of the, the dock of the box places, oh, they've got muscle spasm throughout. Eh, do they really have muscle spasm? More importantly, how can you define if somebody is significantly obese, BMI about 45, there's so much fat on their back, how can you get palpate down to the musculature? And you can't, it's really hard to do. So, but they, they have to make the effort. The sensory examination, again, all the dermatomes in the lower extremity, pinwheel testing, two-point discrimination, 
there's a lot of things we can, that are supposed to be done that unfortunately are not done each one. And a motor assessment, you know, can you, if you ask somebody to stand up on their heels and stand up on their toes, they're measuring the L5 and the L4 nerve roots. If you have them dorsiflex their pinky, their big toes, that's the S1 nerve root. That's the reason why we do all those motor examinations. Unfortunately, <laughs> they're just not done with any kind of regularity based on the records I've looked at. And a range of motion assessment. And remember, range of motion is really subjective. Uh, oh, he, this individual has muscle spasm and guarding. Well, then the range of motion doesn't mean anything because he's not moving. But <clears throat> this is really a range of motion loss, which will tell you different things. And deep tendon reflexes. We talked about upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, and here's where the deep tendon reflexes come into play. But it's hard to get like a knee jerk or an ankle jerk reflex. If you don't do it correctly, you're not going to get a positive response. Continuation on the first visit, the treatment plan would include without radiculopathy, activity modification, that will go back to work with restrictions, a home-based physical therapy program, and medications, over-the-counter preparations. Don't get a start on opioids. There's no indication for that. In fact, the most recent literature that I saw three years ago, you could treat somebody with a non-steroidal like ibuprofen and Tylenol and get the same pain relief as you can with Norco. Everybody likes Norco <coughs> and uh, it's out there, but it's not needed. And you don't need plain films at the first visit. Most often than not, it is not a radiographic situation. It's a myofascial strain. However, if there is a finding of radiculopathy, this will require close clinical follow-up. If there are specific neurologic findings, this person uh, has loss of bowel bladder control, MRI. There's no, there's a sensory loss or motor function loss, MRI, because then the nerve root is compromised and you want to get to it sooner rather than later. If the MRI is positive, the ODG will support electrodiagnostic studies so as to identify what nerve or nerve roots are compromised at what location and to what degree of severity. If the MRI is positive and the EMG is positive, this is an open door to get to the surgery clinic and get evaluated to see if surgery is needed. But then the surgery should be appropriate for the pathology. By well, that I mean laminectomy or discectomy and not lumbar fusion surgery right out of the gate. Second visit, after three days, before 10 days, make sure everything's going fine. You don't want to delay treatment. Delaying treatment is not a positive thing. A good thing would be get them in, get them treated, get them better as quickly as possible. And you want a documented physical examination. Unfortunately, in this stage of electronic medical records, it's the same thing over and over again. But wait a minute, nobody has the exact same blood pressure or the exact same range of motion on two consecutive visits. That's somebody being lazy, but that's what we have to deal with. At that point, at the 10 days that they're still symptomatic and there's still physical examination findings, get them over to physical therapy. Statistically, 50% of individuals will require physical therapy. Unfortunately, there are those occupational health centers that everybody requires physical therapy when it's not warranted. And then there should be a good assessment of the ability to return to work. The literature holds that you get somebody back to work sooner, they do so much better. If they're not back to work in six months, your chances of getting them back to work ever is less than 50%. And then consider screening for psychosocial symptoms. Does this guy really want to go back to work? Does he like being at home, you know, watching Judge Judy and drinking beer? Who knows? The third visit, usually completed between day 10 and day 17. Again, you don't want this to get away from you. Document progress and treatment to date. Evaluate for red flags. If you haven't already got an MRI, maybe this is the time to think about it. <coughs> and then talk about the efficacy of the physical therapy. The ODG will allow up to nine visits for a lumbar strain. However, it also says in the ODG, reevaluate them at six visits to see if it's working. Why do the extra three if we're not getting any better? What did Mr. Einstein say about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? Same thing with excessive physical therapy 
acupuncture, chiropractic, or anything. In fact, there was a study out about 15 years ago that said if you had a low back injury and you gave them three options, chiropractic, physical therapy, or doing nothing at the two-week mark, which group does better? And the answer was they all do the same. You could do nothing. You could do chiropractic or physical therapy, and in two weeks, chances are they'll all be at the same spot. And at the end of 17 days, 75% of those individuals should have been returned to work in a regular duty status. That's just simply, you, you got to get it, got to get them teed up for this and make it happen. And then at, at each situation, if there's a possible referral for surgery, there needs to be objectification of pathology. I'm a surgeon. I did orthopedic surgery for a lot of years. You know, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. And this is what we do. We cut. Asking a surgeon not to operate, that's a challenge. That's what we do most of our pre-authorization stuff. But you have to keep in mind that there are times when surgery is warranted, it is indicated, but before they go to the surgery, surgeon, make sure there's pathology. And as always, guys, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat box or we'll open up the microphones. But I want to thank you for your time. I know I try to condense, <coughs> but some guys, you know, there's orthopedic surgeons that will absolutely do spine. And there's guys who absolutely will not do spine. It can be a complex and a very challenging thing. So I try to boil it down to an hour for you, outlining the, patho the anatomy, the pathology and the treatment. Hope you got something for it. But if you have a question now or at any time, please give me a call. That's my cell. I always have it with me. Or you can email me right there. I'm happy to take your case. And we have all this social media stuff, which I don't understand. That's why I have Alex to make sure she handles all that stuff. Are there any questions? I guess none have popped up. Guys, I want to thank you for your time. I apologize we ran a minute or two long, but it's a good talk. Look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.